Cardinal, we can now see you again, and I trust you can hear us too. I certainly can, Your Honour. And, and we can certainly hear you. Um, Thank you. Ms. Vanessa, I wonder, it might be sensible if you ask the question you were asking again. Cardinal, we've got, yes. we got nothing of your answer, so we'll need to do it again. If I can just have this transcript brought up, I will. Cardinal, I was asking you in relation to government schemes that have been established to compensate people in various circumstances, and in particular in relation to the victims of crime legislation, that the government makes payments, notwithstanding that the government itself is not responsible, nor are any of its agencies <clears throat> responsible for the crime for which it is compensating. Do you understand that? Um, I do. Whereas the Melbourne response, you had accepted a moral, if not a legal, responsibility to compensate victims of crimes committed by, as I think you described them, officials of the church. Is that right? It is. Therefore, the analogy between a state system such as victims of crime and the Melbourne response is far from perfect. Do you accept that? Um, could, could I say a couple of things on that? Certainly. Uh, you, you are... <laughs> Cardinal, Cardinal, I regret, I regret to tell you that we've lost your voice again. Does the dialing back in? Does he know that he has to dial back in? How does he know? But how does he know that we, we, we need that to happen? <laughs> it's a telephone line. It's in the room. It's not working. Video conference line is dropping out. It's five minutes to get back, isn't it? Right. So he would now know that he should be dialing in. I was going to say the, the telephone. Is there any prospect of audio alone? Yes. Is that simpler? No. Um, what I mean, no. I'm 
told that the problem. Cardinal, we can now see you again. Can you hear us? I can see you and I can see you, Your Honour. Right, Ms. Finesse. I'm afraid, Cardinal, again, we've got nothing of your answer here. So, Ms. Finesse, we'll just remind everyone that, that the subject of the question and then back to you for the answer. Um, Cardinal, you were answering a question in respect of the uh, analogy that could properly be drawn between the Melbourne response and a state-sponsored uh, victims of crime compensation scheme. That is correct. Perhaps you would repeat your answer. We didn't receive any of it here, Cardinal. Very, uh, very good. Uh, I, I agree with you that it is not uh, a uh, perfect parallel at all. Uh, one of the difficulties for us in those uh, days was there were few, if any, other uh, and similar schemes to ours uh, in existence. Uh, to some extent, uh, the church situation does resemble that of the government. Let me give a non-controversial example. If there is a series, for example, of trucks uh, carrying merchandise uh, around the country, if, uh, in fact, these are improperly serviced, or the drivers are pushed to work for too long, obviously uh, there is a culpability somewhere in the authority chain. If, in fact, uh, the driver of such a, uh, a truck uh, picks up some lady and then molests her, uh, I don't think it's appropriate, because it's contrary to the policy, for the uh, ownership, the leadership of that company to be held responsible. Similarly, uh, with, with the church, if the, and the head of any other uh, organisation, uh, if uh, there has been, every precaution has been taken, no warning has been given, it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, not appropriate for legal culpability to be um, foisted upon the authority figure. If, in fact, the authority figure has been remiss through bad preparation, uh, bad procedures, or um, uh, been warned and done nothing or insufficient, then uh, certainly uh, the church official uh, would be uh, responsible. So I agree with uh, your basic uh, point that the comparison with the uh, crimes uh, compensation is not entirely um, appropriate, but I'm not uh, sure what other models we had at that stage to uh, compare with. And I might say that um, the amount we paid then, uh, 18 years ago, uh, compares uh, similarly, uh, at least in absolute terms, not value, with, uh, and once again, it's not a perfect parallel, uh, with the, the victims of harassment and uh, molestation in the armed forces, in, uh, with uh, that to the compensation paid for the last few years. Cardinal, uh, when you first established the Melbourne response, did you uh, know yourself of the uh, potential damage that abuse might cause to a child and their development and their life story? Um, this is 18 years ago. Uh, obviously, my understanding has deepened with uh, uh, the years, but I did understand uh, then uh, something significantly about the level of suffering and for that reason the uh, access to counselling was uncapped from our point of view. When you say your knowledge has deepened, do you mean that you have come to a greater appreciation of the consequences for some people? 
Uh, Your Honour, I have been wrestling with this problem for 18 years. Uh, I've met uh, many uh, victims who've suffered enormously. Uh, some, a few, uh, very hostile. Uh, I have heard the uh, stories of uh, terrible sufferings uh, in, uh, in some cases. Uh, the Foster's Girls is uh, one such uh, of case. Uh, of, of course, uh, if you deal with this thing uh, regularly and over a long uh, period, you come to understand better uh, and better the suffering that is caused. Cardinal, can I ask you to turn to tab four in the bundle in front of you? Cardinal, this is yes. a, thank you. This is a document you refer to in paragraph seventy three of your statement and you refer there to the appointment of Professor Ball as responsible for administering the provision of professional support services, that is treatment, counselling and support to victims. And your understanding is set out in paragraph 73, is that these are the terms which were accepted by Professor Ball. That's correct? Um. I believe so. Now, if I can turn your attention to page two of that letter. There yes. Are, there are a number of dot points, Cardinal. Can I ask you to look at the second dot point? And that reads, to advise the Archdiocese on strategic responses to sexual abuse. Uh, um, what uh, page is that? Uh... It's page two, Cardinal, and it's the second last dot point. Second last dot point, yes. Do you see that? To advise the Archdiocese on strategic responses to sexual abuse? Uh, I do. Do you recall now what advice that you received from 1996 until 2001 from Professor Ball that fits the description of strategic responses to sexual abuse? Um, no, I don't uh, remember any such uh, uh, advice except uh, uh, perhaps uh, better ways to help uh, victims. Mm. Can you help us now with what it was you were contemplating at the time that Professor Ball was engaged? Precisely that. Better ways to help victims? Yes. And, and the use through of the word... Through... I'm sorry, Cardinal. What was that? Through counselling services, through medical helps. And the use of the word strategic, what does that uh, mean in that context? It means that we'd be part of an overall plan not something that was uh, ad hoc and made up on the run. Now, turning then to the third page of this letter, I can draw your attention to the second last paragraph. And this yes. is from uh, then Monsignor Hart saying to Professor Ball, it is noted that from time to time you provide treatment to priests of the Archdiocese. Obviously, you will not have direct contact with persons who claim to be victims of such priests, but with that proviso, no conflict of interest is perceived with your role as the support professional. Now, is that a view that you shared with Monsignor Hart at the time of Professor Ball's appointment? Um, it is. Did you consider that the issue was one of perception in respect of Professor Ball's appointment rather than a technical issue of conflict of interest? Uh, I never regarded it in any sense as a technical issue. Mm -hmm. It was... Uh, 
a professional uh, issue. I discussed it informally with a number of people. I certainly discussed it uh, with uh, Professor uh, Ball. And uh, eventually, I believe there was a clearer distinction, but that uh, uh, that stage, uh, given that his role was oversight and supervision, and given that no person was obliged to go to him for counselling, that I thought his role as leader uh, of this uh, uh, service was appropriate, given his uh, distinguished record, uh, given his high level of competence and high level of appointment. You didn't consider that from the perspective of a victim or complainant that to have as the public face, as you refer to in this letter, of the service provider for victims, a person known as providing treatment to priests and giving evidence in respect of priests. Yes, that was certainly very carefully considered. And was it considered with the benefit of advice from victims? Um, certainly that advice was uh, tendered for example, by the Fosters, by families of victims. And those families of victims conveyed to you their concern, didn't they, that the public face of clinical services provided to victims was a man who gave evidence in courts in respect of priests charged with sexual offences against minors and provided treatment to priests? It was uh, one of his... Uh, many, uh, many duties. Um, we did not feel that it compromised uh, his uh, professional uh, integrity and we moved, of course, to uh, assuage, not completely, these concerns by repeating that nobody had to go to Professor Ball. Well, it wasn't a question of his professional integrity, was it? It was a question of how victims perceived his position as the public face of clinical services being provided to victims of church abuse in the Archdiocese. It's not about him, we it's about them. And we can, their, uh, their argumentation, their point of view, very, very carefully uh, took advice but uh, uh, at that stage, uh, we did not share it, did not share their views. So how did you take their views into account? By, by listening to them, by asking advice on their views, by discussing the matter with Professor Ball, by asking what were the comparable professional standards in this area. Was what he was doing uh, unique or was it something that was not uh, uncommon in the uh, psychology profession. You didn't understand, Cardinal, that it wasn't about Professor Ball and his views, it was actually about the victims and their views? Uh, I think that is an understatement and somewhat misleading. Uh, it very much also concerned uh, Professor Ball because there was an implicit uh, a criticism of his integrity. So you saw it in terms of Professor Ball's integrity rather than the perceptions of victims. Is that right? I, could I repeat that that is exactly what I have not said. Can I, I said that the considerations, the point of view of the victims was very carefully considered as well as the position of uh, Dr. Ball. And ultimately the victims' concerns were rejected. And uh, the views of the victim's advocates on the suitability of uh, Professor Ball for this role, we stated we did not share them. Now, can I ask you to turn to tab 87? That's in the second volume, uh, Cardinal. We've been so far dealing with the first volume.
Do you have that? I have opened now. Now, do you see that's a memo to you from Helen Last, who at that stage was part of the Pastoral Response Office? Yes. And if you can turn to the second page of that memo, the third paragraph refers to Mr Foster having had issues arising from a recent meeting with Professor Ball. Do you see that? Yes. Yes. Now, wasn't it the intention knowing Professor Ball's other work, that he would not meet with somebody who, in the language of Professor of uh, Monsignor Hart, claimed to be, or in this case, a father of a victim of a person he had dealt with professionally? Could you repeat the question? Certainly. I'll read to you the paragraph I've just taken you to from a document in tab four. That document, which was addressed to Professor Ball from Monsignor Hart, said, and I quote, it is noted that from time to time you provide treatment to priests of the archdiocese. Obviously, you will not have direct contact with persons who claim to be victims of such priests. Now, that was a document I just yes. took you to. Now, coming right. back to the document at tab 87 and the third paragraph on the second page refers to a meeting that Mr Foster had with Professor Ball. Do you see that? Um, um, I, I do see that. Is it not the case from what Monsignor Hart had said that... Obviously, as he said, it was not expected that Professor Ball would have direct contact with someone like Mr Foster. I don't know whether it said exactly that or with the victims. Uh, one, I wasn't uh, really aware of this meeting, but I presume it could only have occurred with the, with the consent of Mr Foster. See, now, Monsignor Hart was referring to uh, those who, provide, who received treatment from uh, treated priests in relation to the archdiocese. And indeed, as we know, Professor Ball didn't treat O'Donnell. He met with him for the purposes of providing a report to the court. You understand that? I do. But nevertheless, it was the intention, wasn't it, based on what Monsignor Hart said, that Professor Ball would indicate if he had had a professional relationship with a priest in order not to meet with or be involved with a person who was either a victim or, in this case, the father of a victim. Do you accept that was the intention? No, no with due respect, I don't, because uh, what... Uh uh, Monsignor Hart said, uh, obviously we'll, you will not have direct contact with persons who claim to be victims of such priests. You don't accept that the intention was that he would not have contact with those who were, in this case, the father of a victim in circumstances where he had a professional dealing with the priest, the subject of the allegation? Well, you would have to ask uh, Monsignor Hart that what he was talking about was victims of such priests. So they were his exact words. It was indeed. In your view, uh, Cardinal, in setting up uh, this scheme with Professor Ball in the role that he was, surely it would have been your intention not to cause any additional stress to any complainant or complainant's family by putting them in touch with Professor Ball in circumstances where he had had a professional dealing with the priest, the subject of an allegation? Uh, I would certainly uh, not have done anything to increase distress. I would have been open to any suggestion that uh, a responsible person felt might ease or help the situation. 
So coming back to tab 87, uh, Ms Last is raising with you what Mr Foster had raised with her, uh, that is his lack of faith in Professor Ball because uh, he, had, uh, he was from the forensic psychiatry area and had provided a report in respect of O'Donnell. Do you see that? Um, I, I do see that. He had re uh, provided a report on O'Donnell uh, on the effects of a jail sentence on him as a, an older man. And secondly, that Professor Ball did not tell the Fosters of his involvement in that case. Do you see that? Um, I, I, uh, I'm not really sure whether that was the uh, case or not, but I've got no reason to dispute it. You would expect, would you not, Professor Ball to have disclosed and indeed made inquiries in order to disclose whether he had been involved in a matter that he was dealing with the victim or in this case the family of the victim. Well, I, I'm not a psychiatrist and I don't know what the appropriate professional uh, procedures would have been in that uh, case. But uh, I have uh, and had a great confidence in uh, Professor Ball. You don't I, I wasn't aware of the particular meeting. You don't need to be a psychiatrist, do you, Cardinal, to understand that a person in Professor Ball's position would be expected to disclose or make sufficient inquiries to be able to disclose his professional dealings in respect of the offender concerning the family of the victim before him. I don't know whether you would need to be a psychiatrist. You might need to be a lawyer. I'm not well versed uh, on this. Uh, I would ask uh, Professor Ball and uh, uh, other appropriate authorities if it was inappropriate, was inappropriate. Well, Professor I Ball... I was unaware... I beg your pardon, Cardinal. I was unaware that uh, uh, beforehand, and I think at any stage, that this meeting uh, had happened. I was unaware then. But Professor Ball uh, has provided a statement, Cardinal, for your information in which he says that he did not recall having uh, had that professional dealing with O'Donnell. He, that he did not recall having that professional dealing with O'Donnell? Yes. Um, now, I, one, I don't recall such a letter, but it, it would be inaccurate if, it, uh, it, uh, if he did say that. Is, what, is that the document I have? Uh, no, it isn't, Cardinal. I'm telling you to be fair to you that Professor, that Professor Ball has provided a statement in which he has dealt with this issue and indicated that he did not recall having had the dealing with O'Donnell, that is, having met with him on one occasion and then provided a report. Well, that, that certainly seems to be inaccurate. Well, it's Professor Ball's statement, Cardinal. Well, I, I haven't read Professor Ball's uh, statement. I have read uh, a document uh, which uh, states that he gave uh, advice in a court case um, about the effects of jail on O'Donnell. Uh, I believe that, that no one has suggested that's inaccurate and therefore uh, someone's recollection is at fault. Perhaps if I can ask you to turn to tab 88. Uh, this is a memorandum from Monsignor Hart as he then was to Mr O'Callaghan who was a partner at CAUSE in respect of this issue? Uh, yes. And there he, that is, Monsignor Hart records what Professor Ball had said to him. And then in the what final... To prof I, I beg what Professor to Ball... What Professor Mon Ball is reported by Monsignor Hart as saying that he does not remember 
father of Donald, except for the consultation, and it was quite an objective one. That's right. And then he says, I suspect that the Fosters are overreacting, although understandably. That is correct. Now, is that a view that you now share? With the, the virtue of uh, hindsight, uh, I would uh, um, not share that view now. Uh, now, turning to the next tab, if you would, tab 89. Do you have that? I do. And this is a letter from the Archdiocese lawyers to Monsignor Hart in relation to the memorandum that I've just taken you to. And in the second, yes. in the second paragraph, uh, the lawyers say that when Professor Ball was appointed, we knew that he had been previously involved in the treatment of priests and it was recognised that where there had been such a contact in a specific case, he wouldn't be personally involved, which is not to say that he cannot meet with the victim to form initial views. That is not personally involved in the treatment. Uh, the lawyers then suggest that it should be made clear to the Fosters that as Professor Ball had had previous contact with O'Donnell, they will be referred to another person for treatment. Do you see that? I do. And you would agree that that was an approach that should have been taken by the Archdiocese, that is, in the circumstances of Professor Ball's professional dealing with O'Donnell, the Fosters should be referred to another person? Um, uh, my understanding is uh, that that was what the Archdiocese did, as that is, that there was no suggestion that the Fosters girls uh, would be obliged to go to um, Ball. Well, not just the Fosters girls, it would be Mr and Mrs Foster as well, isn't that the case? Um, well, that wasn't said in uh, Monsignor Hart's uh, letter. Uh, here, um, it mentions he cannot meet with a victim uh, except to form initial views. Uh, I'm not sure that the Foster family is explicitly included in the uh, suggested prohibition. So do you see that paragraph I just took you to? That clearly is a reference to the Fosters as a family, is it not? Not just the Foster girls. Uh, that, uh, the, the third paragraph on the first page, is that the one you're referring to? That is, Cardinal. Yes, that, that's correct. Now, can I turn to another topic? Uh, Cardinal, you are aware, aren't you, that the Royal Commission has sought documents from the Vatican concerning allegations of sexual abuse of a minor and the decision-making process undertaken by the Vatican in respect of those matters? I, I am. The... Royal Commission wrote to the Secretary of State, Vatican City State, on the 24th of April 2014, saying, among other matters, that if the Royal Commission is to fulfil the terms of reference provided to it by the Australian and state governments, it is essential that the Royal Commission understand the nature and extent of communications between those congregations and the Holy See in relation to child sexual abuse complaints about Australian clerics. You understood that, Cardinal? I understood there was some such request. Have you seen the letter of request, Cardinal? I believe I have. It continues on to uh, indicate the Royal Commission's understanding based on the Guide to Understanding the Basic 
CDF, that is Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, procedures concerning sexual uh, abuse allegations, uh, that is that a local bishop is to refer an allegation of sexual abuse of a minor occurring within his diocese to the congregation, referring all necessary information, and then the CDF may authorise the local bishop to conduct judicial or administrative penal processes. Canonical penalties for a cleric judged guilty include dismissal from the clerical state and also refer grave cases directly to the Holy Father. You understand that that's the basic procedures in relation to the requirement to refer such matters to the CDF? Um, I believe uh, that that is the case since about 2001 and 2002, but that does not preclude uh, the local churches uh, from uh, dealing with this matter in, uh, for example, an administrative way in other ways. I'm no canon lawyer, but that's my uh, understanding, uh, that uh, the local church is expected to deal justly and expeditiously uh, with these uh, complaints. So it's the case, isn't it, that the local church or diocese or archdiocese can place a priest on administrative leave without having regard to the Holy See? Exactly. But in order to have a priest laicised against his wishes, it is a matter that needs to go to the Holy See? Uh, that, uh, that is correct. The basic CDF procedures as set out in this document refer to the requirement to refer allegations to the CDF and the CDF can then authorise a local bishop to do something in respect of it. That's right? These are uh, uh, post-2001 regulations. Yes, they came into effect in about April 2001, didn't they, Cardinal? Um, now the... If, uh, I, I, yes, I got no... I didn't know it was April. I didn't recall it. I'm happy to accept it. Thank you. Now, the stated purpose of the Royal Commission in requesting documents from the Vatican was to enable the commissioners to develop an understanding about the extent to which Australian clerics accused of child sexual abuse have been referred to the Holy See, in particular the CDF, and the action taken in each case. <coughs> now, in making the request, the Royal Commission was mindful that it might be necessary to examine the archives of the Holy See to identify those files referred to the CDF and the documents recording the CDF's deliberations and responses. And the letter went on to note that the Royal Commission would be guided by the Secretariat in how product production of those documents might best be achieved and indicated that it was keen to collaborate with the Secretariat to put in place an effective process to facilitate the identification and transmission of documents. Now, without perhaps having all of those details in mind, you were aware of the general nature of the request made by the Royal Commission? Uh, the extremely general nature of the re request, I was aware of it, and I thought it unreasonable. I thought the aims could be equally well achieved uh, by asking specific questions about specific cases in a range of different circumstances. So you formed the view that the request by the Royal Commission of the Vatican was unreasonable? Um, Is that your evidence? I, I formed... Uh, the view, uh, which I will uh, announce, uh, enunciate again uh, in a minute, aware that the Vatican had uh, provided 5,000 pages of documentation <coughs> in relation to specific requests, and aware also that the Vatican has said if there are more specific requests, they will uh, provide such uh, 
documentation, but in uh, following international convention, they will not uh, provide uh, in the internal working doctrine uh, documents uh, of uh, another sovereign state. Now, uh, have you at any time prior to leaving Australia, as you did in, I think, late March, early April of this year, make any inquiry of any senior official at the Vatican in order to ensure that whatever request the Royal Commission made for documents from the Vatican uh, might be received in a positive manner? I, I didn't uh, make uh, a, a request that any, so any and every uh, request might be met. I certainly met with uh, uh, the Cardinal Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, for a lively and interesting discussion in which we uh, agreed that uh, the Doctrine of the Faith should provide any specific information uh, requested by the Royal Commission. Cardinal, uh, before you took up your present appointment, did you ever receive an assurance from any official in the Vatican that the Vatican would provide to the Royal Commission any document that it sought? Uh, that, is, uh, that, that is correct. Sorry, you did receive such an assurance? I did. I suppose in retrospect there would be some discussion over what any document meant. Uh, I would certainly, if it was never spelled out, uh, have uh, understood that as specific request, perhaps a big number of specific requests rather than some ambit claim. Uh, yes, and uh, I won't go into the detail, but the, the letter uh, that was exchanged does deal with the particulars, but are you able to tell us who gave you that assurance? So the initial assurance? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was... Uh, the assessor, Monsignor Peter Wells. And does he still have the same position in the Vatican? He uh, still uh, uh, is of a view uh, exactly as I have uh, explained it, and that is the view of his superiors and the uh, prefect uh, of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, an added relevant uh, point is that overwhelmingly every document that is held uh, in Rome exists here in the archives of religious orders or dioceses. Every letter they have sent to Rome, every response uh, from Rome, every, nearly every, I'm not aware of exceptions, overwhelmingly they are available in Australia. Uh, so do I understand that when you were assured earlier that a request from the Royal Commission would be met, any request would be met, um, there was not a discussion about documents which related to the decision-making processes in Rome. Is that right? Um, yes, that would have... Uh, I, I'm not quite clear whether I addressed that particular point at all. No, but you can understand that uh, an assurance in general terms would, on its face anyway, extend to documents which reveal the decision-making process. Uh, no, I wouldn't make that, uh, draw that conclusion, uh, but I, I didn't consider such a, uh, a precise issue at that time. Yes, Ms. Vanessa. Uh, Your Honour, I tender the um, letter dated the 24th of April 2014. That will become Exhibit 16-10. Uh, there's a um, reference in that letter to, no, to two priests, one of which has been redacted. Yes, very well. Now, The letter in reply 
Cardinal was dated the 1st of July 2014. Uh, did you have any role in compiling that response? Uh, no, I did. Ha I did. I have announced. I have uh, reported. I did have um, a meeting, but I had no role whatsoever in the, uh, the preparation of that reply. But you did have. I was I in, in my discussion, in my discussions uh, with the Roman authorities. I was generally and strongly supportive of the request from the Royal Commission. Were you strongly and generally supportive of the request for particular documents or generally and strongly supportive of the entirety of the request? I was uh, generally and strongly uh, in support in the terms of which I have uh, described it for specific documents, not for internal working documents. And another point which I hadn't mentioned, obviously there are cases which are still going forward, if there are any, in Rome. Uh, Your Honour, I tender the response from the Vatican dated the 1st of July 2014. It will become Exhibit 16-11. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cardinal. I have no further questions. Cardinal, before I ask Council whether they have any questions, there's just two matters that I want to take up with you. Um, you appreciate that the Royal Commission has the very difficult task of considering what, if anything, might be done about a general redress scheme. You understand that? I do, Your Honour. Yeah. And let me assure you, it's not an easy task. Uh, Your Honour, I was very much involved in putting together the Melbourne response, all arms of it. Uh, I was. Uh, involved in putting together the, uh, uh, the compensation panel. I have uh, uh, s some limited understanding of the difficulties and political constraints in which you are working. I would be delighted if uh, the Royal Commission uh, could provide to the government before governments, before the end of the year, such a scheme uh, so to, to quickly uh, address uh, the sufferings of people. Well, I regret to say it won't be before the end of this year, but uh, we're doing uh, uh, what we can to do it or complete the task as quickly as possible. But uh, when one considers a redress scheme as we must do, one also has to look at the question of the rules in relation to civil liability. And you and I had some discussion about these in Sydney when you gave evidence, you may recall. Uh, I do recall it uh, uh, well, Your Honour, and uh, uh, not to being a lawyer, it's not my favourite ground. No, I just wanted to um, just give you the chance of um, responding to my thoughts in relation to your comment earlier this afternoon when you spoke of the truck driver. Do you remember? I do. Yes. Now, of course, the truck driver that you contemplated was a driver who may have picked up a passenger in the course of carrying out their duty as the truck driver, wasn't it? Um, they're driving, well, the, I'm truck. Not they're driving sure. the truck and they pick up a, by a bystander who, the, who they offer a lift to. Yeah, well, that would have nothing to do with his general work, Quite. and I don't know whether there would or would not have been uh, regulations about whether he should or shouldn't have done that. Quite, and, and it would not have anything to do with his normal work. But when a priest, through the um, activities of the parish or in any other way, gains access to a child who comes to the church with the parents' consent, the relationship between the priest and the child is quite different to that between the truck driver and the casual passenger, isn't it? Um, yes, I would certainly concede that. And it is similar to it is similar to the position of an official in any other group. It's similar, not necessarily quite the same. An official in any other group uh, to which parents 
consign children or allow the children to attend? That, that's right. I, I've expressed it previously as uh, the, the invitation is offered by the organisation, be it a religious organisation or a sporting club or whatever, to the parents to trust their child to that organisation for whatever purpose. You understand that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And what we're grappling with, of course, is whether that creates a different relationship in law, or should, which should be reflected in the law, rather than the truck driver picking up the casual passenger, you understand? I, I, I do. I think it's an important issue, and in both cases, and especially for the church, what is important is what their rules and doctrines and standards and regulations are, uh, and the extent uh, to which uh, malefactions, if that's uh, the word, are effectively deterred, discouraged, uh, <coughs> um, and there are proper, proper vigilance. But uh, uh, yes, I'm, 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 I understand your general position. And, and I assume you understand that the common law, amongst other things, has uh, been seen as a vehicle by which society imposes a discipline on the actions of individuals, corporations or organisations uh, by reason of the fact that liability, financial liability may follow from a misdeed. Do you understand that? Um, I am, uh, have a great admiration for the common law that has been developed and in place for uh, hundreds of uh, years uh, and as an adversarial way uh, of uh, establishing uh, the truth um, it, it, uh, with the protections it uh, provides to defendants and uh, accusers uh, I, I think uh, uh, to, the, to a, a lay from my lay perspective I have uh, a great respect for the provisions of the common law Now I don't expect an answer. This is not the place for us to have this detailed discussion. It will happen with church people in Australia, and they may uh, consult you, of course, but um, I should just let you understand that the Commission is looking at the question of redress in conjunction with any rules of civil liability. Um, and it may be that um, if you change the rules in one limb or provide a different redress arrangement, under the redress limb, you have to look at what the common law rules should be going forward. Do you understand that? Uh, I do. And the other additional point is that uh, I have a strong view that uh, uh, all organised, similar organisations should be treated similarly. I understand that. Um, now, a separate matter is this. Um, when you set up the Melbourne response, um, uh, I understand that by that time um, criminal allegations, if not convictions, had surfaced in relation to um, some priests. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. Now, um, before you became aware of those allegations um, by reason of the press or information brought to you that a priest had been arrested or charged, were you aware of any allegations against priests or religious in the diocese? Any um, uh, allegations uh, that uh, came to my knowledge were reported uh, to the uh, authorities and I had no knowledge of any uh, criminal behaviour uh, that uh, was not being dealt with. So that you had no knowledge of allegations that weren't forwarded to the police, just so I understand clearly, is that right? Um, I, I, I'm not even sure to what... Well, that's certainly correct. 
Um, I'm not even sure to what extent I would have been privy uh, to matters that might have been criminal that were being dealt with uh, by the Vicar General. Um, so who, who, who had the authority? So is it possible that the Vicar General was aware of allegations that you weren't aware of? Oh, certainly. Certainly possible. I'm not saying uh, certainly possible. You see, I wasn't in the direct line of authority before I was Archbishop. I was an auxiliary bishop who had no responsibility in this area. Uh, the few, few years before I took over, and Monsignor Cudmore as Vicar General, I think, did a, a, a sterling job, and he reported uh, uh, directly to the Archbishop. But once you became Archbishop, um, uh, were you informed of any allegation against any priest in the diocese? And no, I don't think I was in a, any particular way before we put the independent uh, uh, commissioner uh, into place. And I, I don't recall any such uh, information, uh, but I would have expected and I anticipated would have, that any matters that were being dealt with by the Vicar General's office would con have continued to so, in relation to any allegation previously brought to the Vicar General or any allegation which subsequently surfaced, uh, they would all be dealt with by the Vicar General and you as Archbishop may not know about them, is that right? No, no, certainly if I was Archbishop, uh, I, uh, I think I would have been informed. No, I think I, I would have been informed. Right. But there was only a brief time when I was working with the Vicar General in this area because now, we moved to a different system. Now, before you came, became Archbishop, had you ever observed any behaviour by a priest or religious which you um, believe may have uh, indicated some uh, sexual difficulty uh, in the, in the behaviour of that person? No, I don't uh, believe I have. Very well. Um, no, um, I have some questions uh, on behalf of Paul Hersbach. Are you right on the brief ones? Can you hear that, Cardinal Bell? <coughs> I can. It might be best if I go to the lectern. I think it might be best if you go to the centre and we can make sure you're on the camera. Can you see me, Cardinal? Yes. My name is Cash and I appear on behalf of Paul Hersbach. Uh, you no doubt would have viewed his evidence that he gave in these proceedings. Uh, is that the case, Cardinal? I'm aware generally of his evidence. And that wasn't the question. The question was, uh, did you view his evidence, Cardinal? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I, no. I have a job here in Rome. Looking after... <laughs> Look, looking after its finances, is that right? That's one of my, that's my main task. And that was your primary objective when you sought to preclude, I suggest, as many common law claims as possible arising out of sexual abuse at the hands of your priests. Is that right? No, as a matter of fact, it's completely wrong. Well, I may not go to heaven for this, but I suggest you're being disingenuous, I, I Cardinal, would... if you just listen to this. I suggest you're being disingenuous, Cardinal, when you say your primary objective was to help the victims. What do you say about could that? I be allowed a, could I be allowed a chance to speak? Yes, you, yes you, certainly may, you certainly may, Cardinal. You respond as you wish. I have addressed uh, this uh, uh, matter earlier in this uh, hearing. The fact that I did not uh, view the evidence of your uh, client and was, uh, uh, I was aware of the transcripts in general terms uh, was because this happened before my time on the watch. I have uh, already stated 
and uh, I repeat that my primary concern uh, was uh, not financial, and I'm also well aware that uh, through the Melbourne response in its non-adversarial, uh, private and expeditious um, um, treatment of these uh, matters, that money could be provided to people in keeping with the teachers of Jesus Christ, do they? This is completely different, isn't it, your organisation? I have just explained to you that uh, the church is not always of the highest integrity. Yes, it, is, uh, it existed for 2,000 years and there is a long history of sin and crime within the church and one of the functions of the leadership of the church is to control and eradicate this. But your response, and you would expect this of the Catholic Archdiocese, wouldn't you, would be to take on board your moral obligation. And as distinct from a trucking company, a trucking company might not be so concerned as with moral obligations as might the Catholic Archdiocese of Melbourne. That's fair, isn't it, to say, you might think? We strove to meet our moral obligations by instituting the first comprehensive scheme uh, here in Australia uh, with four arms to it. A judicial a decision, uh, counselling, compensation and pastoral support out in the, uh, out in the, the parishes. Uh, we, uh, we were among the front runners in Melbourne in uh, addressing uh, these uh, scandals and uh, I would suggest to you that that uh, is entirely consistent with Catholic tradition and the teachings of uh, of Christ. In accepting as you did the moral responsibility for the conduct in question, leaving aside what a trucking company might do, the Catholic Archdiocese of Melbourne, would it not then have had, as a matter of decency, an obligation to place no impediment in the way of a victim to receiving complete and fair compensation? Um, let me say a couple of things on that. There are quite different levels of responsibility. If there is uh, uh, negligence 
proper, improper, inadequate uh, preparation. Um, uh, then, and the, the, the authority is, is uh, remiss, then there's a higher level of responsibility, and then there might be uh, when the good procedures, but uh, um, the mistakes are still happening, crimes were still committed. I am in favour uh, of the general prescriptions of the uh, common law, and if they are uh, followed, I would, uh, because they are very conducive to establishing the truth of particular situations, and so I would not be, um, uh, I would not uh, be recommending a wholesale abandonment of those common law protections. Perhaps, uh, perhaps I'm uh, making it uh, too obtuse, but can we reduce it to simplistic uh, language, please, sir? I'm simply putting to you that your organisation is the Catholic Church, an institution of the highest integrity. In those circumstances, don't you accept that if you recognise a moral obligation here, that you shouldn't be standing in the way of full and fair compensation for victims of sexual abuse by priests of your organisation? Is that not an unreasonable suggestion? It uh, is a reasonable suggestion that there is full and fair uh, compensation uh, related, of course, to the gravity of the offence and the suffering of the victim. You don't deny for a moment that someone like Paul Herzbach and his father, Tony, endured the most horrendous of obscene behaviour in their presence and were deserving of significantly more than they actually received, surely. Uh, I, uh, I don't uh, know Mr Hurstbach's uh, case oh, beyond, you don't. Uh, beyond the general outline because that happened uh, before my time as Archbishop. Uh, I have no uh, evidence or inclination to deny what you're saying. Sir, uh, had you taken the time to even view a recording of the evidence that he gave in these significant proceedings, you would have seen or heard Paul Hurstbarg described how it is that initially when I signed the deed of release, release I felt some relief, some better. But he feels that uh, having signed it and having received some money, he's come full circle, he's still within the control of the church. He told us about how... I'm not he told us about how he felt that victims would, they would, uh, their healing process would be assisted if they were released from the restrictions that the deeds impose upon them, namely the prevention uh, of suing the church. With, as you say, your primary objective being to help the victim, sir, you'd no doubt, in light of that evidence, uh, suggest that fairness would dictate that they be released from those restrictions. Is that fair to say? I'm not in favour of uh, uh, requiring a deed of release. Do I understand your evidence? Can you explain that answer to me? I don't know if I understand it with respect. Are we losing signal? 
I think, Mr. Cash, no. the, I think, Mr. Cash, the Cardinal really has made his position plain sure, Honor, please. Uh, in relation to the deed of release, and he spoke of the action he took in Sydney. I think we do understand what his position is in relation to it. Thank you, Your Honour. No further questions, Cardinal. Yes. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, Your Honour, I have some questions. Yes. Cardinal, um, it may be convenient for all of us here if we took a five-minute break. Would that be suitable to you? Certainly. Yes. We will resume in about five minutes. <laughs>